Bon, chers amis, chers amis, bonsoir et euh, merci à toutes et tous d'être là. Ça, ça nous fait chaud au cœur à moi et à toute l'équipe Pemium de vous joindre à nous pour célébrer nos 10 ans. Alors, travailler pendant 10 ans sur, Pemium, sur Bitcoin, évidemment, c'est une aventure. On ne s'ennuie jamais. Hein. Euh, on ne s'ennuie pas. Soit y a, ça bouge au niveau de la technique et là, nos... Nos amis de la technique, avec Dominique, là, qui, qui, qui est notre CTO, qui va, qui va s'asseoir, peut en témoigner. Sur la technologie, ça bouge tout le temps. Je crois que cette année, c'est un peu le décollage de Lightning Network en particulier. Mais on peut dire que depuis 10 ans, on ne s'est pas ennuyé. On est à la version 22 de Bitcoin Core. Enfin, ça bouge tout le temps. Et puis, ça bouge tout le temps aussi sur le plan de la régulation. On a eu... Euh, je pense en dix ans, une dizaine de comptes bancaires. Donc euh, on ne s'ennuie pas non plus avec nos amis euh, régulateurs, parce que chez Pemium, on est quelque part hein, un peu à la passerelle entre le monde d'avant et euh, le monde des cryptos. C'est un, euh, un peu notre métier. Donc euh, cette soirée, ce soir, je la place, euh, je dirais, sous le signe de la, la reconnaissance, la, la, la gratitude vers euh, d'abord nos clients, nos premiers clients, euh, donc, qui remonte, je dirais, à la période 2011-2013. Donc notre, notre premier métier chez Paymium, ça a été de rendre les gens riches, hein, puisqu'il y, y a pas mal de sociétés qui travaillent à les appauvrir. Nous, on essaye de les rendre riches, et pour certains, ça a marché, et on espère que ça continuera. En tout cas, on essaye de leur faciliter l'accès aux, aux cryptos. Donc, gratitude vis-à-vis -vis des clients, gratitude vis-à-vis -vis de nos investisseurs, ils sont là aussi ce soir, pour la plupart, et euh, évidemment, ils ont cru en nous, ils ont validé notre vision en 2015, c'était pas si évident que ça, 2015, c'était une année très très euh, flat, c'était un peu l'hiver nucléaire des cryptos, pour ceux qui se rappellent de cette période, euh, où le cours était complètement à plat, et on se demandait dans quel sens ça allait aller. Donc, euh, encore une fois, merci à ces investisseurs, et puis euh, aussi gratitude à nos partenaires qui, euh, qui nous ont accompagnés, qui aujourd'hui joue un rôle aussi très important puisque c'est un écosystème et la gratitude sous laquelle je place cette soirée, la valeur que j'aime bien mettre en avant, elle est, elle est miroir aussi de la, de la générosité des, des développeurs du logiciel libre qui, font, qui, qui donnent leur temps et leur expertise pour développer cette technologie et qui font que on peut la mettre à disposition du plus grand nombre. Et ça, c'est la magie du logiciel libre. C'est ce sur quoi on travaille et ce sur quoi on croit et qui fonde aussi notre succès depuis dix ans et j'espère pour les années qui viennent. Now I'm going to switch to English because we have a guest tonight. Uh, our guest is Max and uh, Stacy, a wonderful couple from, uh, that flew from the US to uh, celebrate with us. Uh, Max and Stacy are uh, Bitcoiners from the early days. Uh, they were uh, in Prague for the first Bitcoin conference in 2011, uh, which I attended with them. That's where I first saw them. Uh, where I first saw uh, Max on stage, <laughs> and that's something I wanted to, uh, an experience that I wanted to share with you tonight, uh, to have him uh, talk about uh, Bitcoin and, and Premium on stage. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a global system, it's a, it's a global movement, and, and uh, it took uh, people like Max and Stacy and, uh, in the US uh, and elsewhere, uh, myself in France, many people in other countries uh, to talk about Bitcoin uh, in the early days. And um, also, I thank my uh, uh, co-founder, Gonzag, in the back, that was also part of this adventure and uh, also took part in this uh, um, uh, role of evangelist that we have. Um, so thanks, Stacy and, and Max, for being with us tonight. And Max, the uh, floor is yours. Yeah! Let's hear it! Yeah! More! 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 Raise it up! Merci, Pierre! Mon fuck, Pierre! Who I met from at the very first Bitcoin conference that we launched this revolution! We were part of this revolution! We took our first steps on this revolution, and now this revolution is changing the world. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, 
where we have hyper Bitcoinization happening right now in El Salvador. El Salvador. El Salvador. El Salvador. They've made Bitcoin legal tender. This is a warning shot across the bow to every central banker in the world that Bitcoin is here, it's legal tender, and your fiat money is crap. I have uh, the distinct pleasure of uh, introducing, in a very short period of time, Christine Lagarde will be here. We'll be able to speak on her and her comments. But let's just say, on the level of the central banks, whether it's the Federal Reserve Bank of America or the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, their days are numbered because all they've been able to do for the past 30, 40, 50 years is every single problem that comes up, they have only one answer, and that is to print, 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 and print again. It doesn't solve inequality. It doesn't solve the green house gas problem. It doesn't solve climate change. It doesn't do jack shit. All it does is cause inflation. And now food is skyrocketing and people are starving. Why? Because central banks don't stop printing. <laughs> and as Christine Lagarde has said, there is a, an escape hatch. And she talks about Bitcoin as being that escape hatch. And she's absolutely right, because it's a ladder out of the fiat money uh, nightmare that we've all had to endure for years. And it's cost us dearly. It's cost our children dearly. It's cost everyone a chance at having a hard money and, and an opportunity. And I, when I walked in here tonight, I looked around and I said, what style of architecture is this? It turns out it's... Louis the 16th. How appropriate. I have with me tonight. Hey. Hello, Louis. Et Marie Antoinette. Oui. Well, you know, it's not about decapitation. It's about decapitalization. <laughs> so Bitcoin is the peaceful revolution. We're simply going to crowd out the bad money. And for this reason, they don't see it coming. Because they only know one thing, and that is violence and war. Fiat money is backed by violence and war. War eats up that paper money, and there's no end to the war because they can keep printing more money. Certainly in the United States, we were just got out of a war. We were there for 20 years. How did we afford that? We just printed lots of money. Meanwhile, people are dying by the tens of thousands in the street from drug overdoses. There's no social uh, programs whatsoever. All they know is how to print more money and it causes incredible social dislocation. It causes incredible poverty. It causes incredible misery. And finally, countries like El Salvador are saying, enough is enough. We want to get out of this U.S. dollar system. We don't want the U.S. dollar world reserve currency anymore. We want to be independent. So they make Bitcoin legal tender. And already they're going to save $400 million in remittance fees from uh, Western Union. So Western Union is going to be like Blockbuster Video or any other company. The Kodak camera company, they went out of business. Western Union's business is done. The, the money transfer business is done. It's dead. And all that money goes where? It goes into the pockets of people living in El Salvador who are now empowered and they're impassioned and they're starting new businesses and property values are moving up and their GDP is probably going to triple in the next five years simply because they went from... Uh, U.S. dollar and hyperinflating local currencies to Bitcoin. Other countries in the region are going to do the same thing all over Latin America. They're going over to a Bitcoin standard. They're making Bitcoin legal tender. Ukraine, they just made Bitcoin uh, elevated its legal status. What's happening in Africa? 
Well, Nigeria is exploding with Bitcoin activity. A third of the population is now hyper-Bitcoinization. They're doing Bitcoin every single day. You can trade in amongst all these African nations without the bureaucracy, without the interference, without the intermediaries, without the fees. And you can build businesses. And that's exactly what they're doing. And what about the energy usage that we hear? Oh, it uses too much energy. Well, there's 170,000 terawatt of energy used on planet Earth last year. How much of that do you think was used in the Bitcoin mining and the Bitcoin network of the 170,000 terawatts of energy? Was it 10%? Raise your hand if you think it's 10%. Was it 5%? Raise your hand. Was it even 1%? One-tenth of 1% one of global energy secures monetary sovereignty potentially for 8 billion people. Is that a waste of energy? No. In fact, what happens to the carbon footprint on planet Earth when you get out of fiat money and you get out of the war machine, you get out of the violence business? It's actually going to drop precipitously. You're going to have energy usage in the globe cut in half or more because you don't, it's not backed by violence. Even the New York Times, they have a columnist over there, Paul Krugman, who's their Nobel winning economist, who said, was asked just a few years ago, Paul, the dollar, what backs the dollar? And he said, the dollar is backed by men with guns. That's what backs the dollar. That's the status quo. That's the Washington consensus. That's the hell that we live in today, is fiat money backed by coercion, backed by violence. Bitcoin is an escape hatch. Bitcoin is getting away from all of that. Bitcoin is a way to achieve individual sovereignty. It's unconfiscatable. It's unmutable. It's uncensorable. What happened to Julian Assange when he tried to raise money for his legal defense fund? Credit card, Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, cut him off. Can't do that, Bitcoin. Nobody can censor it. What happened to Iran? They're trying to do some deals. The U.S. said, we're going to censor the SWIFT money transfer system. Boom. Can't do that with Bitcoin. Now Iran's actually mining Bitcoin. 2% of the global hash rates are Iran. I come here tonight, I meet miners in the Congo. I meet miners in China that are now in Texas. Think about all that mining that was in China. 50% of all the mining capacity for Bitcoin left the country and went to mostly Texas, the entire, half the entire industry, half of a trillion dollar industry moved uh, around the world in a couple of weeks. Try going into your uh, Bolivian silver mines and picking up half a trillion dollars worth of silver mining, put it in your pocket and move over to another part of the world. Think about that. Is that, that's not possible, is it? You did it with Bitcoin and now the hash rates Going higher. The hash rate will soon hit new all-time highs. The price soon will hit new all-time highs. It's mathematically certain that the Bitcoin price will always guaranteed mathematically increase its purchasing power in a world of all fiat money. It's mathematically guaranteed. Two plus two equals four. And Bitcoin's purchasing power is mathematically guaranteed to increase in purchasing power forever. As long as there's fiat money out there. Fiat money, by the way, is guaranteed to lose purchasing power. And we know this from history because of the past 300 years, every single one of the fiat money schemes that have ever been created have lost between 99 and 100% of their value. Every single one, none have survived. They're all dead. The euro will soon be dead. The US dollar, dead. The last one, you know, it's been around as the British pound, but uh, it still has lost 99% or so of its purchasing power. And now they have to Brexit. Who gives a shit? <laughs> Who gives a shit about the Brits? Who gives a shit? <laughs> and now uh, we must... Uh Please welcome to the stage from CEUBE, Madame Christine Lagarde. Je m'appelle Christine Lagarde. Je suis chef de BCE. Il y a des problèmes, mais ce n'est pas un problème pour moi parce que j'ai un ou 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 il ne marche pas. Quel horreur! Oh my god! I have to use this by manual. Pierre, what is the problem with my money gun? Complete 
Merde! Et voilà! Ah! Ça marche maintenant! Oh! Il y a des problèmes! Pas de problème! Il premier! Il premier! Il premier! Je suis Christine Lagarde! Chef de PC! Et... Oui, 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 c'est. Il y a de cinq, cinq années maintenant que j'ai eu rendez-vous avec Dominic Strauss-Kahn. Oui, c'est. Nous sommes à deux plus deux. Et fait un petit ménage à toi avec euh, une banquière suisse. Il est complètement nu comme moi. Mais c'est normal, cause de je suis Christine Lagarde. OK, thank you, Christine. Big round of applause for Christine. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. All right. Ah, bon. Ah, oui. Ah, bon. Oh my God! Well, you know, I haven't been in Paris for a few years, and I was distressed to hear that Johnny Holiday is gone. <laughs> I love that guy. <laughs> All right, so we are in the process of the um, global insurrection against banker occupation. So this has a bit of a history to it. You know, we had the uh, Occupy Wall Street that was happening around 2008. Uh, we had the Arab Spring. Uh, you know, there's been this tension in the world for years to push back against what is essentially the banking establishment. It wasn't always known that the key problem were the banking establishment, but as that consciousness became more developed and as people figured out that, you know what, it's actually the people printing the money that are the problem, that we had this move toward something else to fix all of these problems. And this is, I think, why you have now this grassroots global phenomenon of people coming into Bitcoin and seeing that it's a way for them to maintain some type of agency, to some maintain some dignity some and, and individual sovereignty. And so this is the... The, the, the part of what we've been calling on Kaiser Report now for over 10 years as this global insurrection against uh, banker uh, uh, of, of um, global insurrection is banker occupation. And um, we have developed a few truisms. So I'm going to share with those with you. And these are some of the, the ideas that one can take on board as being part of the philosophical uh, mantra of Bitcoin. Pierre and I had lunch the other day and we got into a very, very deep philosophical conversation that lasted quite some time. And uh, then we were thrown out of the restaurant eventually. But some of these things we came, come to know and regard as almost sacrosanct in the Bitcoin world. One thing is that you don't change Bitcoin, Bitcoin changes you. So what do we mean by this? We mean that people like Elon Musk, for example, who show up, they're very wealthy, they're on TV a lot, they're charming, but they have this attitude like, I just found out about Bitcoin and I'm here to make it better. And this is the attitude that doesn't work in the Bitcoin world. There is a process where one must come to accept Bitcoin on Bitcoin's terms. The rules are set. It's all about rules but no rulers. And, at the, and so everyone essentially has to take a back seat to the protocol and the immutable nature of that protocol. Uh, we say that you don't fix Bitcoin, Bitcoin fixes you. Uh, we also talk about the white paper of Bitcoin, which is about nine pages long. How many people have read this white paper or looked at it? There's something about the white paper that's been misunderstood. And it has to do with the words on the very front page of this white paper. And it talks about Bitcoin being electronic cash. But if you read the white paper, it says uh, on a technical level that it's actually electronic gold. Uh, in Satoshi's notes, as he was writing this and developing this, he talks about Bitcoin being a substitute for gold. It's, it's quite explicit that he mentions it in that context. But for, we have lived through a period where of, of those who decided that they were going to reinvent Bitcoin, they hard forked Bitcoin, they created things like Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, and these other uh, imitations have all been essentially failed projects, and um, the market has told us that they've become failed projects, and it's because they refuse to simply accept Bitcoin on Bitcoin's terms, and that is to actually read the source code and not 
get waylaid by the text of the white paper. Satoshi himself said he's better at writing code than he is writing uh, text. He said, actually, since the white paper was written after the code, uh, you know, he, he almost apologizes for it. It's not as elegant as the code itself. But for the many years, this was a problem because those who had big media space were pushing these alternative projects. I would say that period ended with the emergence of Michael Saylor. Uh, from MicroStrategy, who uh, only just a year and a month ago or so came on into the space, completely fluent in what Bitcoin is really about, talked elegantly about how all cash on all balance sheets are essentially a melting ice cube, losing purchasing power every minute of every day. And he committed billions of dollars to of MicroStrategy and his own money into Bitcoin. And he became a true Bitcoiner. He spoke the Bitcoin language. He reached out to the Bitcoin community and really has put the kibosh on a lot of these, uh, what we call fake Toshi and these other projects that are uh, altcoin projects that um, are really a distraction more than anything else. Uh, so I, I am very uh, encouraged by that. And I think that uh, going forward, we're gonna see Bitcoin's market capitalization and and usage continued to move sharply higher. And we're gonna see all of these altcoins, just like they always do, they essentially fade away and they just kind of disappear. You don't hear about them um, and, and that's it. So we, we just have the level of players in the space now is so big and with others coming on board, uh, BlackRock and other huge money managers, that, that story is only, only going to become only going to become bigger. I know Pamium's talking to a lot of these people all the time. Uh, and, and so the, the order flow coming in from uh, the big players uh, is really fundamentally changing the nature of this business. And uh, on the grassroots level, it's happening really in a, as a two-pronged attack because on the grassroots level in these countries like El Salvador and others, uh, people are adopting it and realizing that this is a way for them to actually save money you know, um, uh, and, and have wealth that's unconfiscatable. And that's really a, a remarkable message. And to get back to the central banks, they are completely, I still believe, uh, blind to what's happening. And the price, even though it's at 45000 or 50000 a coin, is remarkably cheap. Just listen to Christine Lagarde's uh, comments today. Um, she said, essentially, that um, Bitcoin was uh, 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 not a currency, full stop, and that, according to Christine Lagarde, it would never work as a currency, and that was her comment. Without any context, without any actual arguments, just she's asserting, in her opinion, that this is the truth. She's, she's worse than Peter Schiff. You know, Peter Schiff will say that, now by the way, Peter Schiff, I told to buy Bitcoin at $10 a coin. He never bought it. He's been buying gold over the past 10 years. Bitcoin's up over 400,000%, gold's down 6%. But he still clings to it that, that, that Bitcoin is not something he's interested in. He's gonna cling to his gold because he's rhetorically stuck on stupid, right? He can't move off that space, that egocentricity. Um, and, and this is a problem. If you're a narcissistic jackass like a Christine Lagarde or a Peter Schiff, you're not going to understand Bitcoin because you can't get it out of your own way. You're too self-obsessed. Look at me. I'm a fucking egomaniac. And yet I'm still able to get Bitcoin because I had to learn. It had to kick my ass. You know, I had to go through the process. You know, it takes a few years. You know, uh, and then you say, you know what, I'm finally ready to accept the fact that, uh, you know, Bitcoin changes me. I don't change Bitcoin. And th so, so the price at this level, and when you consider that the total investable assets of planet Earth, if you put all the real estate, the bond market, the property market, the art market, uh, current, you put it all together, it's about $400 trillion. And that's Bitcoin's total addressable market. It's under a trillion. It has 400x on the upside. 400x. You know, imagine 50 years from now, your grandkids are saying, Daddy, Daddy, did you buy me Bitcoin when it was under 60,000? <laughs> no, son, I, I, I listened to Peter Schiff. <laughs> Daddy, I'm not talking to you anymore. 
And that's going to be some horror-filled conversation of the future. You can travel through time with Bitcoin. That's incredible. So uh, the, considering that we still have these conversations at the highest level of policy and, and government that are still speaking of Bitcoin in these terms that are what we call FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, that were talked about you know, 10 years ago in 2011, we first heard these things, and they haven't educated themselves yet. So that means that we're still early. So at $45,000, $60,000 a coin, Bitcoin is still early. At the very least, in the next few years, it'll be parapassu with gold at 10 trillion. So that's a 10x right there. So you gotta ask yourself, can you really afford not to have something in your portfolio that's gonna 10x? in the next three to five years. And again, I will state this categorically, and I worked on Wall Street for many years, and I know it's very, very rare that you can actually use a word like guaranteed, but I can guarantee you that Bitcoin will increase purchasing power in a world of all fiat money, because I can guarantee you that all that fiat money is gonna lose purchasing power, because they have nothing up their sleeve except to print more money. There is no raising of interest rates. There's no tapering. They're not gonna reverse money printing ever, because it would mean instant death to every bank and insurance company and property developer in the world. They can only print, and they're in such a horrible Weimar Republic printing nightmare globally right now. In the United States, 40% of every all dollars that have ever been created in the history of the country happened in the last 18 months. Think about that. They're absolute, the money printer go burr. They're absolutely off their head. And they've been hiding the inflation by not reporting on the actual prices, by omitting things from the, the index, the CPI index, by outsourcing America's factories to China, right? And Americans didn't notice because although they lost their job, the cost of that flat screen TV was a lot cheaper. So they're like, well, I know I lost my job, but I got a great TV, so fuck it. Well, now all that arbitrage between China labor and American and global labor is shut, right? Now all the money printing is going right into the CPI. It's going right into the food price, going right into energy. It's going it's right into the, people are seeing it and they're noticing it. And getting back to the fucking revolution, you know, it was the price of wheat that went up. Uh, the magic number is when the price of food is 40% of your income, you insurrect. We saw it in Egypt, we saw it in France, we've seen it before. Once the price of food gets to a point where people are starving and babies are starving, people don't give a shit anymore and they insurrect. And that's what they're toying with, that's what they're playing with, that's what they count on us not responding. And uh, we got Bitcoin. We have Bitcoin. It's unconfiscatable. The price is guaranteed to go up. It's uncensorable. We can always do transactions and no matter how much they print, it only, the only thing it can do is make the Bitcoin price go up. So Bitcoin was designed to be attacked. It was designed to be attacked because the more it's attacked, the greater the hash rate. The greater the hash rate, the higher the price. The higher the price, the more people are using it. And suddenly all those central banks are defunded. All those banks that they serve, defunded. So attack me, bitch. <laughs> attack me. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So here's a senator, Senator Brown from America, to give you an idea of what they say there. Quote, there's nothing democratic or transparent about a shady, diffused network of online funny money. He called for smart regulations that protect consumers from crypto extortionists and their phony populist marketing. Phony populist marketing. Phony populist marketing. Hello, hello. It, I'm sorry you've lost your head, but you fucking deserved it for calling my starving kids a phony populist message, you cunt. Which I can say in France because it's totally acceptable. <laughs> Last I heard, right? That's one of the greatest things, not only is not only is the cheese fantastic, but I can say cunt all I want. I'm going to say it again more later on. I'm so excited. Oh, let's see. What else can I say? Oh, how many people believe in God? Let's see. We've got a, quite a religious crowd. 
I, I, you say you don't, you don't want to admit you believe in God, right? You're just quiet. You're, I'm quietly going to church, you know. It's going, I, or you actually are. You're, you're atheist. Are you atheist? You're an atheist. You're an atheist? The rest of you actually go to church. So I have some news for you. Bitcoin is actually sent to us from God. <laughs> and this is how it happened. Back in the 1990s, there was a project called SETI at Home. Does anyone remember that? It was a search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And all the uh, people who own computers, and I did this myself, we downloaded the SETI at Home software, software, and we linked up this massive parallel computing system around the world to search for radio frequencies to try to find extraterrestrials. Now, the cover story is that no extraterrestrials were found. But the truth is, in one of those radio frequencies from outer space came God. And God looked around, and what he saw on planet Earth troubled him. And he said, you know what? I'm going to have to fix this, because at this rate, these dumb humans are going to become extinct and that would be sad, because in France, I get great cheese. <laughs> so he said, I could send my son down there again, or you know, something similar to that. But we've already done that. It's been there, done that. I've got to come up with something new, something fresh. So in the minds of the cypherpunks, he put a thought into their brain of solving the double spend problem and how to solve this problem that had been a problem of the cypherpunks for 20 years. It's Adam Back's hash rate plus the difficulty adjustment, said one of them one day. And so they wrote a white paper anonymously, but we all know that the writer of the white paper was none other than God. <laughs> Obviously now, in retrospect. And so they launched the code in 2009, on January 3rd. And at first, like Jesus in the manger, it was ignored. But after a few years, people started to understand it and trade it and, and, and begin to absorb the principles and the philosophy and, and, and the, the protocol as an example of something that's incorruptible, that's perfect. You know, humans have been looking for perfect money for hundreds of thousands of years. We love to trade with each other. The problem is that our money has always been corrupt in some way or, or not adequate to the job. Gold eventually became great money for this reason because everyone accepted it. It was, you did it by weight, a gold, an ounce of gold here is the same as an ounce of gold there. But still there are problems. You could have fake gold. You had uh, gold-backed ba banks, partially backed banks. So gold is not really the superstar that Bitcoin is, but it had to suffice for, for, for many years. Uh, the, the need for money has been so strong. I read somewhere that the human face evolved over thousands of years in a design that it allowed it to take a punch. And I think that was a lot of bad deals. A lot of deals went bad. There's a lot of violence. When you do a deal and you feel like you were taken in that deal, somebody ripped you off. Violence ensues. The need for perfect money has been something the American, the, the, the human consciousness has been searching for for hundreds of thousands of years. How can we transact? How can we uh, communicate? How can we integrate? How can we be together and exchange ideas, exchange products, exchange services, exchange goods um, w w with something that will be universally uh, seen as perfect money with perfect price discovery, where the transaction is, in fact, the verification? which is the truth with Bitcoin. I don't need a third person to come and tell me that the gold is real, that they're gonna back up that fiat money, that those cowrie shells are not gonna be uh, you know, imported by Spain by the millions. The transaction is the verification, is the transaction. And as a result, in God's infinite wisdom, he's given us humans a way out of our misery of fiat money. And since 1971, it's only been fiat money. 
The U.S. closed the gold window, and it's been all fiat money. All prices are relative to other fiat money. The dollar only has value relative to the euro, relative to the yen, relative to the drachma. It goes on and on and on. There's no absolute valuation. How can you build anything with a yardstick that where some, everyone has a different opinion of how many inches should be in a yard? Or a foot? Or centimeters? <laughs> right? You can't have all those variables at all time. It would seem like an obvious point, but for some reason we live in this world and everybody has a different opinion of what's valuable. And now, you know, it gives rise, in my opinion, not to get too political, but we live in a world of social justice warriors where people are really confused because they're not sure what the values of anything are anymore. It's very, very confusing times. I think it's very, very confusing times because we, we don't have a, one standard of money. And why would we want money? Because we want to trade, we want to talk, we want to communicate. So Bitcoin is the answer in that respect because it represents perfect money, it has perfect price discovery. And um, so, you know, I, I liken it to, to, to my God story, which I think is absolutely suitable, uh, if not a bit wacky. Um, how about Jack Dorsey, who's a, who runs uh, Square? He said something recently, uh, about Bitcoin, he said, I'm not trying to make money. I'm trying to fix money. Right? So uh, that's a very profound statement, I think. And I think that's true. Um, here's a couple of uh, two reasons that I, that I wrote down why the French should be particularly interested in Bitcoin. I have two major reasons. Number one, it allows you to be on permanent vacation. <laughs> right? Think about it. Why spend eight or 10 weeks a year on vacation when you can spend 52 weeks a year on vacation? With Bitcoin, since the value goes up every day forever against all that fiat money, you'll never have to work another day in your life. I know I haven't worked in years because my Bitcoin keeps going up. It would be foolish to work. <laughs> uh, the second thing is that it represents essentially a permanent manifestation. <laughs> people say, <laughs> I lived in France for many years, and people say, oh, did you see the French protests on TV? And I'm like, um, you know, it must be Tuesday. It's like, show me a day where there's not a French protest. That's what they do. That's what they like. And it's usually all the protests, you know, it goes on month after month, okay, it's great. Because, and there's solidarity, which is great. So, and I always know, I've learned that there's only one thing to really be worried about if the, the manifestation, that the French are protesting, there's only one thing to worry about, is if the farmers show up. <laughs> That's it, there's like, Oh yes, it's, it's horrible, we can't get this. And then the farmer showed up. Oh no. Et voila, and that's usually what happens. Be why, because I don't wanna go on my French tangent because <laughs> you're French. All right, um, I can go, who wants to hear Bitcoin uh, as described as sex? Raise your hand. Who wants to hear my sex metaphor, anybody? I did my God metaphor. I have a big sex thing. I mean, I've used a lot of curse words already. You might be like, get this fucking guy out of here. I don't know. It could be, I don't know. Hello? Who wants to hear the sex metaphor? Come on. All right. Here we go. Get ready for the global synchronized Bitcoin orgasm. Now think about this. The blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, every 10 minutes, you get a new block. So, uh, and it's global, and it's synchronized, and every transaction that's ever happened before is codified going back 700,000 blocks, and the past is completely immutable, and you can't change the past. There's no revisionism. You don't, nobody can come in and say, well, actually, uh, last year was different, or 50 years it happened differently. No, everything that happened in the past is completely on the, immutably on the blockchain and can never be as transparent and can never be revised. The, the history is, in fact, 
done. It's dead. It's recorded. You can't change it. Don't try to change it. It's there. The future, because we never know where the difficulty adjustment is going to take us, is a mystery. It's a mystery. So now you apply this to the human psyche, and you remove something that's key that we won't have to deal with anymore, and that's fear. Fear that our past will be erased can't happen anymore. Fear that we have financial uncertainty can't happen anymore. Fear that we are rejected. No, nope, because you can trade anywhere, anytime, anywhere at Bitcoin. It's never going to happen. So what's left? Love. That's right. Love. And everyone's coming together, and they're trading together, and they're in love. And every 10 minutes, everything's totally synced up. And then everyone notices that, actually, let's all just fuck. So then they're on the floor, and they're all naked, and they're having a massive orgy. And every 10 minutes, it's a massive global orgasm of love, thanks to Bitcoin. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> oh, man, I'm having too much fun. Gold enforces war. Fiat enforces slavery. Bitcoin enforces peace. That's true. Here's another quote from Christine the Cunt Lagarde. See the way I worked that in? It's subtle, right? Okay. She said, if we don't vaccinate the whole world, it will come back to haunt us and hurt us in the form of new variants. We have spent in fiscal support somewhere around $6 trillion. What is needed is 1% of that in order to vaccinate the whole world. <sighs> that's, not, that's not a remit, okay? That's not what she's up there doing. Just focus on leaving. Just resign, go away, leave us alone. This is all bullshit, fuck you. Um, here's another, uh, enough about Christine. This is some more a philosophy of Bitcoin, something to keep in mind, how to think about it. You know, you're all existentialists. You know, you wake up, you read some, some sart. You have a cup of coffee. You fuck your mistress. I know what's going on out there. And this is what you need to think about. Absolute mathematical scarcity achieved by consensus in a sufficiently decentralized distributed network was a discovery rather than an invention, it cannot be achieved again by a network made up of participants aware of this discovery since the very thing discovered was resistance to replicability itself. All right? Now, that was, that was uh, somebody on Twitter I follow from um, Sweden, I think. Goes by the name of Newt. But that, that, that's, that's something to think about when, when someone brings up the concept of these altcoins or other coins. They can never compete with Bitcoin because they, were, they, they were, came into existence knowing that this discovery had already been made and this discovery is about absolute scarcity. So therefore, by definition, it cannot be replicated. And absolute scarcity is what makes Bitcoin perfect money, perfect price discovery, perfect communication. And, and leads to this trend away from violent fiat money toward peaceful Bitcoin money. And that's, the, that's, that's where we're on the precipice of this transition. We're on the precipice of this evolutionary step, in my view. And when I see things that are happening in El Salvador and Nigeria and other places in the world, I see it happening in real time. When I see people like Christine Lagarde or Jay Powell, who's the Federal Reserve Board, or other major bankers, and, and what they say, I know that they're completely wrong. They put their foot in their mouth. They speak in ways that are patently, observably, uh, indistinguishably wrong, false, falsehoods. They speak utter falsehoods. And, and, and as more people understand this, there's that movement, that social movement, that, 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 that grassroots movement into Bitcoin. And it's growing. It's growing. It is in these countries that desperately need it and around the world. And um, I'll just talk a little bit about energy. You know, I did it already. And um, I'm running out of cards, you know. Um, I suppose um, I could talk, you know, do some, do some questions. Q&A, if there's an appetite for that. Um, I could do that. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to take a few questions. 
I'm going to interact with you all. Because I think I've done a lot of talking already, and I covered all the points, and I'll be... Okay, yes, sir. Are you a What's that? Are you a um, yeah, of course. Let's get the microphone. Pamium is the best uh, in Europe. Top. But, um, yeah, great. Great question. Thank you. Anyone next? <laughs> Who's next? So you can't do the U.S. I'm trying to convince Paymium to make me their spokesperson and that I should do advertising. This gentleman is shaking his head violently, no. Don't do that. That would be a tragic error for the company. Would immediately go out of business. I, I don't know. I think I could do a good advertising campaign. Bitcoin is fuck you money. Brought to you by Paymium. I mean, is that a great ad or what? <laughs> I talked to their legal people. They said, never in a million years are we going to let that happen. I was like, okay, I have time. Because I'm rich. I own Bitcoin. <laughs> All right, who else? Yes. Can you tell us uh, how did you discover Bitcoin? Yes. Right. So in the 1990s, I was working on a project called the Hollywood Stock Exchange in Los Angeles. And I invented a, a digital currency. It's patent number 5950176. You can look it up online. And it covers digital currency, digital securities, and digital market making. But it's a centralized system. So when I found Bitcoin in 2011, it was a dollar. And I started studying it. And I said, you know what? This is a decentralized system, for one. And then from there, you start to appreciate the other beautiful aspects of it. So I had a background in, in digital money. So I was primed for it, but it was, that's how it got started. Who else? Da, 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 da. I'm sure there's a couple of questions. This gentleman here, second row. What do you think about uh, the Chinese miners moving out of China? Right, great question. So the Chinese miners were forced, basically, Uh, to leave China. And so approximately 50% of the market was uh, shut. So a couple of thoughts. Number one, you know, I think this is a strategic blunder by China. You know, 500 years ago during the Ming Dynasty, the leader of China at that time made the decision to burn their entire fleet, the treasure fleet, burn it to the ground because he was He was uh, frightened that the merchants, the merchant class of China was a threat to his rule. And that was one of the stupidest things any leader has ever done in a thousand years. I think uh, second only by China's decision to kick out the miners because we're, we're moving into a Bitcoin era, a Bitcoin hyper standardization, and China was in a good position to lead uh, and, they, and they blew it. Uh, number one. Number two, all that mining went to other places like Texas, where the energy is very, very cheap, and um, they're going to thrive but as a result of it. So, and we saw the hash rate dip, but blocks kept coming every 10 minutes. TikTok new block it was never interrupted. Network never went down. It was a great stress test. It was a great kind of real world example of what happens. You know, a lot of people said, oh my God, China mining concentration is too high. And what if they shut it off? Well, they did. And now we know what happened. It moved and nothing bad happened. So thank you, China. We'll keep our Bitcoin and uh, good luck with uh, the collapse of Evergrade or whatever that new Lehman Brothers of China is now experiencing as the property market implodes because they've got too much debt. Uh, voila. Okay. That's the, that's the answer. Anyone else? Next question. Anyone in the back? Hello? Anyone? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Hey. Sir. Um, to elaborate further on uh, China, yes. uh, what do you think of their uh, sovereign cryptocurrency and uh, sovereign cryptocurrencies around the world? Uh, is it something that may be um, you know, complicated to deal with uh, for existing cryptocurrencies? Are you asking about their central bank digital currency? 
Yes. Right. So in response to Bitcoin now, a lot of central banks, including China, are coming out with the central bank digital currency. The reason why it's a, it's a dead on arrival, you know, is that it's nothing to really be concerned about, really, is because it's totally centralized. By definition, it's a centralized uh, currency, and it's just replicating the exact same problems they have with their current fiat system. So it doesn't compete with Bitcoin. Once again, Bitcoin is decentralized. Uh, and so uh, the Chinese digital bank currency will obviously be centralized. It'll be have controls over it by the government. So it won't be fundamentally different than what they have now. But they will be able to introduce, using these central bank digital currencies, they'll be able to introduce some really nasty uh, things with these new central bank digital currencies. For one, money, I think we're going to see money with an expiration date. So, you know, the, the government will send you money, but if you don't spend it in six months, it expires. So it'll be like money, like a Netflix subscription, right? And they'll probably add in a Pfizer booster as well. So the government will send you a Pfizer booster, $5,000, and it all expires in five months unless you spend that money and take the booster, right? So it gives them a level of control. I mean, getting back to the Lagarde comment pertaining to the virus, et cetera, how they're using the central bank to make, to make medical policy. They're using the central bank to make... Um, environmental policy, and they, they can do this with a central bank digital currency because it gives them a level of control that we haven't seen before, and obviously in China they have that system of the social credit score, where if you spit on the sidewalk, you get a negative, and now you can't buy an airplane ticket, right? So it's all, it's all very precisely controlled in this way, and other banks are envious of this, and that's the feature that's coming, but it's good for Bitcoin because Bitcoin allows people to opt out. I mean, to be quite frank, ladies and gentlemen, it's not gonna be all roses and sunshine. It's gonna be a fight. Uh, the, the Bitcoiners are not, you know, I look at the American Constitution, for example, if you look at all those signatures at the bottom of the Declaration of Independence, something like uh, of the 50, like 30 or 40 were hunted down and killed by, you know, the British. Right? It's not going to be pretty, but it's got, it's got to happen because we're, we can't live in a world of fiat money anymore. So there's going to be a bit of a fight. Thankfully, with Bitcoin, it's passive resistance, and by just hodling or holding Bitcoin, you're, you're helping defund the, the system. But as, as these bureaucrats become more aware of what's happening, as Christine Lagarde really does take on board the fact that she doesn't have any power to stop this, She's not going to just walk away quietly. She's going to, and her uh, cohorts of other bankers, are, uh, you know, they're going to be angry. So um, I, I, I don't want to, I think that's a fair statement. I, I think that would be prudent to say that. Um, that's why when you have Bitcoin, take possession of your private keys and, 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 and secure your Bitcoin. Any Bitcoin left on an exchange is potentially confiscated or the, the exchange gets hacked, that's not what you want to happen. Of course, Paymeme has the highest security measures known on planet Earth, so I'm fully confident that everything's great. But nevertheless, I would still take my private keys and put them onto uh, you know, my own private uh, a Trezor or what have you, hardware wallet, and put it into cold storage, uh, et cetera. And that's just standard operating procedure. You would agree with that, I'm sure, Pierre. That's the standard Bitcoin hygiene is take your private keys and put them in a safe place, uh, protected by a memory phrase, you know, a 12-word phrase. You know, if you're trying to leave the country with a billion dollars in gold or cash, you know, good luck getting through the airport. If you're like Peter Schiff, you try to put a billion dollars of gold up your ass, ooh, that's going to hurt. But um, with Bitcoin, you could go through the airport completely naked and just have a 12-word seed phrase, travel anywhere in the world, and you have your billion dollars. Okay, so that's obviously a lot better than any other of the alternative uh, systems. Um, so that, that's my answer. All right, any more? Well, any more? Um, any, any women? Women in the, in the room? I, th I think that, that was the, the last question the, the we can take. For, for, last for, one. For, for, for. Okay, then. W one more and that's one more, it. One more. One more in the back. One more. Yes? Yes? Yes, young lady. Yes. Right here? Okay. 
Hi. Thanks very much for the presentation. It's very inspiring. Okay. Um, am I right in saying that we should, or it should, the number of bitcoins should be limited in order to prevent this situation of happening, of creating just more money and more bitcoins? Just, right. uh, just my question. Uh, right. There's a finite amount of coins, 21 million coins. And they could not be increased the supply, but it can be broken down into 2.1 quadrillion satoshis, which is a one one hundred millionth of a Bitcoin. You could buy 2,000 Satoshis for a dollar. So there's plenty of Satoshis to go around, but it's a finite number. You cannot increase the number, so you cannot inflate the supply. All right, great question. So anyway, thanks so much. Thanks, Pierre. Thanks, Pamium. Thanks for coming. Great to see you all. Thank you. Thanks, Max.